Bonnie Glazer. I'm a senior advisor for Asia at uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And it is uh, my pleasure, as well as distinct honor, uh, to be hosting today uh, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen. Dr. Tsai is chairperson of the Democratic Pro Progressive Party of Taiwan. And as you all know, she will be the party's presidential candidate for the upcoming elections on January 16th. Dr. Tsai has served her nation in a number of different capacities. In the 1990s, she was a key negotiator for Taiwan's accession to the World Trade Organization. She was subsequently national security advisor to former President Li Denghui. Dr. Tsai served in Chen Shui-bian's administration as head of the Mainland Affairs Council. She joined the DPP in 2004 and was nominated as legislator at large. And the following year, she became deputy premier. From 2008 to 2012, she was DPP chairperson and ran for president in 2012. Before inviting uh, Dr. Tsai up to give her speech, let me briefly say that after her speech, we will be followed in a conversation uh, between Dr. Tsai and Dr. Kurt Campbell. And as all, you, all of you know, Dr. Campbell was Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs in the first term of President Obama. Dr. Campbell is now Chairman and Chief Executive Officer uh, of the Asia Group. We're very pleased today uh, to have Dr. Tsai talk to us about Taiwan's meeting the challenges, crafting a model of new Asian values. Please join me in, in, in uh, welcoming Tsai, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen. Thank you, Bonnie, uh, for your introduction. And my thanks also goes to CSIS for welcoming me into this uh, magnificent uh, new building. And particularly, Mr. Campbell, uh, my old friend, Mr. Berha. Don't know where he is sitting. Well, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and members of uh, the media. Oh, you're there. Well, it is wonderful to be in Washington, D.C. again. It is my great honor and pleasure to meet all of you today. I'm truly grateful to the fellows and staff of the CSIS for making this event possible. On April 15th uh, this year, the Democratic Progressive Party nominated me as its presidential candidate for the 2016 elections. I'm greatly honored to be associated with the political party that fought hard against authoritarian and turned Taiwan into a democracy that today cherishes freedom and human rights. The DPP is proud to have played an imperative role in bringing about such monumental changes in Taiwan. As a presidential candidate, I have to be ready to deal with rising domestic and external challenges ranging from the gradual erosion of freedom and democracy to an increasing uncertainty over Taiwan's ability to maintain its economic autonomy. While responding to challenges, we are actually crafting a model of new Asian value which features participatory democracy, equitable distribution, and social justice, innovation-based economy, and proactive peace diplomacy. As noted by some prominent international organizations, freedom of speech, freedom of press, and human rights have been on a steady decline in the last few years. In March last year, the undemocratic nature of the ratification process over a cross-trade trade agreement unleashed a formidable social forces trying to redirect the path of the government. Now, some of the social forces are eager to participate in the political process through public deliberation or even through participation in elections. The newly found social political 
forces may cause the government to slow down if it is not ready to be transparent or open for participation. However, democratically handled with the input of enormous dy dynamism into the decision-making process and constant oversight from the public, the government can be much more effective and responsive. This is what I am ready to endeavor, that is, to deepen our democracy. For most Taiwanese, the state of our economy is a source of great distress, as it has stagnated for some time and has lost momentum for growth. Globalization and China's rise as the world's uh, factory have affected Taiwan's efficiency-driven model of economic growth. This has gradually resulted in a widening income gap, outsourcing of job opportunities, and stagnating salaries. The economic slowdown has hit the young generation in particular, who now face an economic environment much harsher than their parents' days. In addition, over various public pension, our various public pension funds have incurred huge implicit deficit that endangers their sustainability. Furthermore, the family-based traditional social safety network no longer suits the needs of the highly urbanized Taiwan. Under these circumstances, one can only imagine the tremendous burdens that are being placed on our younger generation. Therefore, providing a new economic way forward will be the foremost priority of the coming DPP administration. I'm ready to present the new model of economic development with core elements of innovation, employment, that is job creation, and equitable distribution. The primary objective of the new model is to reshape Taiwan's economic competitiveness by shifting from an efficiency-driven model to an innovation-driven one. It is also aimed at striking a balance between economic growth and social need. In addition, we hope that the new model can help reduce Taiwan's dependence on a single market and to ensure Taiwan's economic autonomy. We're kindly reminded by former Secretary Clinton in June last year that Taiwan will be vulnerable if it loses economic independence. I also fully intend to build a strategic partnership with the U.S. on economic cooperation. A DPV administration would like to mount intensive exchanges and cooperations on the next generation infrastructure for Internet of Things, cloud, big data, and ICT-based in industries, which features the fourth industrial revolution, or what many call Industry 4.0. I would like to have Taiwan work closely with American firms to renew Taiwan's ICT industries as well. On international trade, there is an urgent need for Taiwan to participate in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, that is TPP at least to be included in the second round of the negotiations. For this purpose, I have set up a special task force to discuss the important aspects of the trade liberalization and the TPP. Our discussions include the need for structural adjustments and reform, the extent to which Taiwan should adhere to international standards, streamlining legal infrastructure and bureaucratic practices, and making the necessary investments in specific sectors. We want to ensure that Taiwan is ready to effectively deal with the challenges of globalization. I would like to thank the U.S. government for expressing welcome to Taiwan's interests. Here, I would also like to reiterate that we, I am determined for Taiwan to be ready for the D TPP. When the economy grows, the Taiwan government will be equipped with more resources to invest in social infrastructure. The DPP has unveiled a plan to create new, a new community-based social safety net and has inaugurated the plan in some of the local governments under our administration. I also plan to invest in social housing as well as long-term senior care systems. 
these are the these are highly demanded in Taiwan as it moves to an Asian society. Here, I would like to stress that investment in the social safety net is not just welfare spending. It will make good economic sense by meeting local, meeting local demand and generating local job opportunities. For Taiwan's economy to be more competitive and our democracy stronger, we need to build a military capable of safeguarding the country and maintaining peace. We should also help shape friendly regional environment by making meaningful contribution to international affairs. Needless to say, a critical component is a need to maintain peaceful and stable relationship with China. Own defense. To be a reliable partner on regional security, it is my firm belief that proper investment in credible deterrence is the key. In light of the increasing military and security threat that Taiwan faces, developing a symmetric capability, capabilities that involve enhanced military relations with friendly forces, well-trained military personnel in the modern force structure, and acquisition of necessary defense equipments are essential components of our deterrence strategy. The transition to a voluntary military force has its challenges. I am committed to securing the resources necessary to provide adequate training and education for the active and reserved forces, so that there is not only a high degree of professionalism among the services, but also a quality connection between the military service and job careers. It is important that male-to-male -male relations with the U.S. continue to intensify in accordance with the Taiwan Relations Act and mutual security interests in the region. Taiwan is and will continue to be a reliable partner of the U.S in ensuring peace and stability in the region. We must also work closely with our American friends, not only in deterring traditional threats and coercion, but also in jointly dealing with other non-traditional security threats, such as cyber, cyber security. In addition to foreign acquisition of defense uh, systems and platforms, I am committed to more, make more investments in indigenous defense programs, including research and development to meet our long-term defense needs. These investments will eventually produce multiplied benefits in Taiwan's economy. It is investment in defense and economy at the same time for the long haul. Taiwan and its people have a special political security economic, and cultural bond with the United States because of our shared value and shared interest. But Taiwan should not take the relationship for granted. I will ensure that Taiwan works together with the U.S. to advance our common interest. Taiwan's international support can be obtained by making ourselves as a reliable partner and by having a proactive diplomatic agenda for peace. Under my watch, Taiwan will meaningfully participate and contribute, provided that it is not discriminated against in international projects such as humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, medical assistance and joint efforts in economic aid with backup support from our active NGOs. Taiwan has a modern rescue training center in central Taiwan. I would like to expand its operation so that it becomes an international training center. I will also seek to work closely with the U.S. on counterterrorism, modeling on the container security initiatives and megaport initiatives, and share this experience with any neighboring country. The former DPP administration established 
the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, and the NGO Committee in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And this is to advance our democratic values and meaningful participation in international affairs. Their work will be rejuvenated if we have a chance to return to office. Making contributions, becoming a reliable partner, will be the spirit of the new DPP administration in the pursuit of international participation. Now, on cross trade, I am also committed to a consistent, predictable, and sustainable relationship with China. Cross-strait relations must be considered in the long-term context. Since Taiwan's democratization, we have had three democratically elected presidents and a strong social will forged by numerous de democracy movements. Freedom and democracy are values deeply ingrained in the hearts of the Taiwanese people. The president elected by the people of Taiwan represents all the people of Taiwan in conducting external affairs. Therefore, the conduct of cross-strait policy must transcend the position of a political party and incorporate different views. A leader must take into account public consensus when making decisions. We do have a broad consensus in Taiwan that is maintenance of the status quo. I have articulated and reiterated my position of maintaining the status quo in the previous months, as I believe this serves the best interests of all parties concerned. Therefore, if elected, I will push for peaceful and stable development of cross strait relations in accordance with the will of the Taiwanese people and the existing ROD constitutional order. The two sides of the Taiwan Strait should treasure and secure the accumulated outcomes of more than 20 years of negotiations and exchanges. These accumulated outcomes will serve as a firm basis of my effort to further the peaceful and stable development of cross strait relations. I will also push for the legislation of cross strait agreement oversight bill to establish a comprehensive set of rules for overseeing the cross strait exchanges and negotiations. The cross strait agreements which are currently under negotiation or legislative review will be re-examined and further negotiated according to the new rules. Last, but most importantly, I will also strengthen our democratic institutions and uphold the right of the people to decide their future, their future free of coercion. While I advocate for constructive exchanges and dialogues with China, I will ensure the process is democratic and transparent, and that the economic benefits are equitably shared. In conclusion, I would like to say this. Taiwan stands at the juncture of history and culture, when people in many Asian countries are still suffering from authoritarianism. We in Taiwan are immensely proud of our democracy and cherish our hard-earned social and political rights and individual freedom, together with the rights of civil society and freedom of choice. As Asia faces rising nationalism, irredentism, and threat of military conflict, we intend to engage in proactive peace diplomacy that fosters peace and stability with the spirit of giving and sharing. When globalization causes economic turbulence, brings unsustainable, unsustainable results in resources, and leaves great, great disparities and injustice, particularly to the younger generations, we in the DPP are ready to undertake a new model of economic development, which aims at building a new economy 
based on innovation, employment, and distribution, as well as to implement a community-based social safety net to complement the traditional family-based care system. These will serve as an important basis for innovation, sustainability, distribution, and social justice. In summary, we are crafting a model of new Asian value in Taiwan to serve as an example and inspiration to others. With this new Asian value, we are ready to light up Taiwan, light up Asia. Thank you very much. Let's just see. Is it all right now? Is that good? Welcome, everyone. It's good to see you here. And thanks to CSIS and Bonnie for setting it up. Dr. Tsai, welcome to Washington. So we're going to begin with just some conversation between us. Um, again, it's great to see you here in person. So I know you've had um, uh, some meetings here in Washington uh, with friends and officials. I wonder if you could characterize them. Were you satisfied? The, were the discussions robust? How did you feel? Well, in general, uh, we have good meetings, and uh, uh, we convey uh, our messages, and we listen to what uh, people and friends here have to say, and the su what suggestions that they want to make. Uh, so, uh, in general terms, I think this is a, a good opportunity to so come to um, Washington, D.C., uh, to talk to uh, uh, people um, who care about Taiwan. Great. We're, we're thrilled to see you here as well. So obviously, uh, a strong, robust dialogue with the United States is essential. I'm curious if you could report to us a little bit about the kinds of discussions and dialogues that you and your colleagues have had and will continue to have across the Taiwan Straits with China. Are you satisfied with the discussions? Do you feel like you have a sense of how the Chinese government is viewing developments on Taiwan? What would you like to see going forward? Well, uh, firstly, of course, this is a very complex uh, relationship that uh, we are faced with. And um, uh, we are not the only player uh, in that relationship. I mean, uh, you have China, you have us, and you also have uh, other uh, countries in the region who all have an interest in a peaceful and stable relationship in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess. Uh, we uh, have that responsibility uh, to contribute uh, to the peaceful and stable relationship uh, across the Taiwan Strait. So I have, a, I have said that several times, um, and this has been our uh, consistent position that uh, we'll make our effort and, and this is our goal, and I think uh, this serves the best interests of all, of the, all the parties involved, mm -hmm. that a peaceful and stable relationship serves um, is, is, is the most important thing for Asia and for Taiwan and for China as well, as um, Asia is going to uh, experience a lot of changes and challenges, and, and what we need is a stable environment so that we can concentrate on the challenges we'll be facing. Great, thank you. So in your speech, you had some very good words about how to perfect the democracy uh, in Taiwan. And I think the fact is that we all celebrate this uh, open, free, and fair elections. And as you pointed out, we're now heading into a set of circumstances where that is almost taken for granted. Um, it's also the case, not just in Taiwan, but in other countries in Asia, um, certain aspects of democracy are under enormous pressure. We see it in Thailand and some places in Northeast Asia. I'm curious, you talk about strengthening your democracy. I think it's undeniable 
that Taiwan is one of the most deeply divided societies uh, in Asia. Um, uh, how would you recommend going about uh, addressing some of these very profound divisions between uh, the parties and the people in a way that leads to a more unified identity? Well, I think uh, the first and, and most important thing is that the government has to be prepared to be open and transparent um, in terms of uh, the government's uh, uh, policy um, that concerns the general public there. And, and also, the public uh, need to be given an opportunity to participate in the decision-making process as well. And, and what is also important uh, in a, um, a democratic uh, society is the, um, the quality and the amount of the NGOs and the civil society. If you have uh, enough amount of NGOs and um, uh, more quality uh, uh, NGOs, um, they are very um, important uh, tools in terms of facilitating the communication between the government and the general public. And, um, and therefore, I will uh, come up with a policy to encourage the establishment of all sorts of NGOs so that um, they will be in a position to bridge the gap between the government and the general public. And, and they may serve as you know, communication channels uh, too. Mm -hmm. and, and also, um, in terms of social forces, um, I think after uh, the Sanfa movement, there is a, a, a rise of the uh, forces in, in Taiwan. And I, I tend to think this is a good development in the sense that, that the public awareness uh, has been um, increased as a result and, and, and people generally want to participate um, in um, the decision-making process, especially policies that affect their livelihood uh, and their future as well. So um, I am actually to a certain extent excited that the people in Taiwan nowadays are more ready and more willing to participate. Mm -hmm. So um, this is your second time running uh, for the presidency. Uh, what did you take from your last campaign? What would you do differently? What will you do differently? And how has the political process changed just in these last few years? Well, the environment today is uh, very different from um, that uh, in uh, 2011 and 2012. But despite the differences, um, I tend to think uh, we have a pretty decent campaign in, in 2011 uh, and 2012, uh, primarily because uh, we ran a campaign with limited resources and uh, we have uh, a, a, a large number of uh, people uh, helping us in terms of uh, making small donations, and they come up and help and 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 you know in whatever way they can uh, help us. So I thought it was a pretty um, exciting campaign that we had last time. Um, but this time, of course, um, the situation is uh, very different. Um, and also, um, we have a longer period of time to get ourselves prepared and have better communication with our friends uh, here uh, and in other places uh, so that uh, our intentions uh, will not be distorted, our intention will not be misunderstood, and, and, and therefore, um, I think in general terms, our communication with uh, our friends uh, outside and also with uh, people, the general public uh, at home, is much better. And as a result, uh, we are building uh, this sort of trust that we need uh, when we uh, run a, a government. So, so I think this time, um, we stand a better chance to win. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be optimistic in politics if there's one thing we know about that. So, 
Dr. Said, let me ask you about this. So um, I'd be curious about your views about the role of gender in your politics and more generally. Um, you know, sometimes uh, women candidates speak about their gender and about particularly what they bring to the race and sometimes they don't. Now, I've looked at a lot of your speeches and discussions. You don't discuss it very much, a little bit, but you talk more about um, uh, policies, economic views. I'd be curious, tell us a little bit about what you think uh, it means to have a woman running for president in Taiwan and what's different about your candidacy with respect to gender. Well, uh, gender uh, used to be uh, a, a barrier of some sort for women to overcome uh, when they want to be in politics. But today in Taiwan, the situation is somewhat different. Uh, for um, women who want to um, participate in elections and, and get elected, um, I think in general terms, there is a preference for women candidates uh, nowadays. Uh, not to the level of the president, uh, but uh, anything below the presidential election, um, if you have a woman candidate, uh, preferably younger, better educated, you get overwhelming preference uh, uh, from the voters. But this time, um, the Taiwan public has to um, face this test. That is whether they can accept a woman leader as president of the country. Um, of course, uh, there are some people uh, in Taiwan who are still rather traditional, um, um, have uh, some hesitation uh, to consider a woman leader. But among the younger generation, uh, I think the young people are generally excited about this idea of having a woman to lead the country. I, they thought this was rather trendy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so overall, you get a balance there. Um, so uh, if you ask me whether gender is, is something that is advantageous or disadvantageous to my candidacy, I think it's OK. But. But for uh, Taiwanese people, actually, um, they are faced with a very serious uh, test, test next year. That is whether we are advanced and civilized enough to accept a woman leader. No? So um, you've spoken uh, uh, specifically about your um, approach to cross-strait relations, and I'm sure we'll have more questions and discussions about this, but I wonder if you could say a few words about other countries. You've talked about China and the United States. Um, Taiwan has a myriad of relationships across Asia and elsewhere. Which relationships are you looking to, which would, would you propose to build stronger dynamics or engagement with either trade or political um, if you were elected president, beyond the cross-strait relationship? I think that the countries in Asia are our priorities. I think Asia is going to uh, have a lot of changes. Are um, there any particular, quite, that's Asia's yes. pretty big with, region. With these changes, there were a lot of opportunities. Mm -hmm. And we, of course, like to explore these uh, opportunities and possibilities. And therefore, I would say um, Japan is, uh, a country that have a long-term relationship with us. And, and the bilateral trade and, and flow of personnel is increasing because we now have this rather convenient arrangement to travel between the two places. Um, the other place, um, I'm naming specific countries, but I'm running the risk of offending others, you know. Um, but uh, the other uh, group of uh, uh, countries that we want to um, have closer uh, relationship with is the ASEAN countries, mm -hmm. because uh, we like to have more trade with them. And, and we also want to have uh, investment uh, opportunities explored there. Uh, the fact that we have uh, a lot of immigrants uh, from Southeast Asia. 
we actually think that I actually think that this is our asset um, because uh, they will eventually help uh, establish our connection with the ASEAN mm -hmm. countries. And I see a lot of opportunity there. And, and we, of course, want to explore these op opportunities as much as possible. Great. Let me ask you, turning our attention a little bit to the South China Sea, you will have seen that our Secretary of Defense was recently in Singapore for the Shangri-La Dialogue and gave some quite specific um, suggestions about the continuation of the American approach about freedom of navigation, peaceful resolution of disputes and the like. Clearly, we're heading into a period where there is likely to be greater tension um, in the South China Sea. What is Taiwan's view of this? Uh, what's your role? And uh, how do you walk the tightrope in the years ahead here? Well, um, perhaps I should remind you that we are not Taiwan yet. Uh, we're still the opposition party. Um, <laughs> But as far as uh, our uh, position is concerned, uh, we should be, uh, we should get ourselves prepared to work with uh, all the parties involved uh, and, and have an interest uh, in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think we're ready to talk to anybody and talk to uh, and explore all sorts of possibilities. Uh, and the, the most important thing is that we will follow international law and the relevant UN conventions um, to make, and, and but the most important thing, as you say, is to make sure that this free navigation uh, will not be uh, a factor as a result of this uh, uh, conflict or uh, differences among uh, different countries in that region. So um, I think, Again, uh, the best way to resolve conflicts of this kind is diplomacy and, and peaceful means. Mm -hmm. So you focus a lot in your speech about the concept of, of the status quo. And it's clearly probably there's no other relationship in the world in which the concept of the status quo is so important. Do you believe in the current environment that the United States, China, and Taiwan have roughly the same definition of what comprises the status quo? Well, um, <laughs> what, you consider that a good question? Uh, it's a softball, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure um, China, the US, and us may have different interpretation of that term. But I'm pretty sure, um, despite we may have differences in ter interpreting that term, but we should all agree that um, maintaining a peaceful and stable relationship across the Taiwan Strait serves the interests of everybody. And, and whatever interpretation of that term, this should be part of that interpretation. Mm -hmm. So I do want to ask just a couple more questions before turning it over to Bonnie. Um, you laid out a pretty ambitious domestic agenda as well. And I think sometimes Americans, American friends, you know, focus maybe just only on one dimension of the relationship. But you talked about transitioning, really transforming Taiwan more towards an innovation society. You must be aware that many Asian states have tried to make that transition and have really been challenged by it. So I'd be curious if you could just quickly lay out what do you think in terms of education, government intervention, um, what investment, what are the key features of a successful innovation economy? Well, I think uh, the, the business culture has to be changed. Um, people generally think that um, failure is a bad thing. I think being a, Failure is not necessarily a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. When you're facing, you were trying to build a new company, new industry, um, and inevitably you will be uh, facing a lot of risk. And, and um, so failure is, is a, a necessary thing to happen. But in Asian countries, uh, they don't take uh, failure well, they thought that um, this is something they don't like and, and try to avoid. 
and if they failed in a particular thing, they feel frustrated and, and they feel that this is something that is not positive. But um, it, that is something um, in the Asian culture. Um, but if you go to Silicon Valley to talk to people there, the lesson one I learned from them is that failure is a good thing. So, so the business culture has to be changed. And secondly, you have to change uh, the, the, the infrastructure, particularly legal infrastructure, because we have been an industrial uh, country, uh, manufacturers of industrial uh, products for a long time, for five or six decades. So all our legal infrastructure structures are, were built at a time when we were producing a lot of industrial products. So this innovation-based economy is, is a completely different thing. So you have to change the whole legal infrastructure to suit the needs of an innovation-based economy. So that is a massive exercise, that is to have a comprehensive examination of your, your legal infrastructure and to rebuild something uh, that suits uh, an innovation-based economy. So you know, in any line of work, you have people you look up to and you kind of model. Uh, you know, when I was a diplomat, I had people that I'd look at either historically or in more recent times and think, God, I'd like to try to be a little bit more like that person or admire the way they do business. As a leader, as you either look in your own political backyard or around the world, give me a couple of leaders that you look at and say, you know, I really admire that person. <laughs> and. Um, I, I, I really think what that person brings to the table or what they've achieved is uh, uh, important, and I'd like to emulate some of that. Well, um, many people would expect me to answer that question with this lady, uh, Mrs. Thatcher. <laughs> Not quite what I was thinking, but yeah, okay. <laughs> But I was reminded by many of her supporters, perhaps uh, she is not a model for us because um, she was a conservative leader. And we are a democratic party. <laughs> so we, I have to look for another one. Um, so somebody else suggested this uh, German um, uh, prime minister. Merkel. Merkel. Um, yes, I like her a lot, um, but, and, and she can be a model, but uh, we are in a situation actually a bit different, no, very different from the Germany. So um, whether it is a model for me uh, to follow, um, I should say yes. Um, but there are other, uh, not necessarily leader, but uh, uh, women politicians that I like a lot, and I learned a lot from them. Um, and I would like to name this uh, lady who you may not uh, consider her as a uh, political leader, but uh, her professionalism, the way she deal with um, difficult issues, have enlightened me a lot, um, and particularly in the 1990s. Um, I'm talking about this uh, former UST uh, uh, Bashevsky. Uh, well, that's very gracious, yeah. Yes. She's on uh, the board here. No, 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 I haven't finished yet. Um, <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Uh, I never asked for taking a picture with uh, anybody, but um, she just visited Taipei, and I specifically asked for a picture with her. So yeah, I have a lot of respect and I learned a lot from her in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. And there's another lady though, uh, um, which uh, who you may know uh, already. That is um, our um, Kaohsiung city mayor, uh, Chen Ju. Uh, mm -hmm. She uh, was a revolutionary. Yeah but she runs a place so well that uh, she earns everybody's respect in Taiwan. So um, I learned a lot from her too. Thank you. I'm gonna ask one last question. Bonnie, why don't you come up and, and get ready? Just So you've talked about characteristics of political leaders. Uh, as you look across the Taiwan Strait, and we've now had a couple of years to observe President Xi Jinping, 
What do you see in him as a leader? Do you see him as a continuity or uh, uh, a, a different kind of Chinese leader? How do you interpret him? And what do you see in terms of what he brings to China's uh, present and future? I understand. I have to answer this question very carefully. <laughs> Well, um, let me uh, say this. Um, he seems to be a very determined person. And I like uh, the idea of this anti-corruption campaign. I think uh, China needs to have housing order and needs a bit of cleaned up. In that regard, I admire his uh, courage uh, to do all this. And, and to many observers, he seems to be a rather tough person. Um, um, not that prepared to exercise flexibility. But as far as Taiwan is concerned, um, I think he is uh, someone among the Chinese leaders who probably know Taiwan better because of his experience as uh, the governor of uh, Fujian province. So uh, I hope that with his uh, better understanding of the situation in Taiwan, um, and also his understanding of uh, Taiwan as a democracy. Uh, and he uh, is in a position to exercise more flexibility when we're facing the differences between us. Good. Thank you very much. Let's, Bonnie, why don't you uh, take a few questions? We've got about 15 minutes left, so please, Bonnie. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tsai, Dr. Campbell, for a really terrific discussion. So I'm going to pick out uh, a question uh, or a couple from the audience. I'd appreciate if you would wait until the microphone comes. Uh, identify yourself. Keep your question very, very short. <laughs> very pointed. Uh, well, I don't okay. mind long questions as long as I get to answer it in short. <laughs> gotta, you got to choose, Bonnie, here. OK, <laughs> over here. Yes, you. Wait for the microphone, please, and identify oh, yourself. So Dr. Tai, um, I came to America um, two years ago from Taiwan, from Kaohsiung, and so I got a more um, domestic question. So like President Ma in his um, administration, he wants to um, push some legislations, but um, most of his legislations are still lying on the legislative again. Um, if you um, became the next president, become the next president of um, our country, like how will you make sure um, your party um, follows um, your um, goals and your minds, and so to pass um, important legislations and don't let them still lay in the legislative rent. Thank you. Well, of course, uh, the most important thing for the coming election is that uh, we have to secure enough uh, seats, legislative seats, in order to get majority uh, there. So we get to um, uh, have to have the opportunity to. Um, form the agenda, legislative agenda, to suit our um, uh, policy goals. So uh, we do whatever we can uh, to get as many seats as possible. And secondly, what I want to do, um, no matter whether we have a majority in the legislature or not, what I want to do is I want to share information with the opposition. I want to discuss uh, issues with the opposition so that, and, and we share credit with the opposition so that um, it's a process of identifying common interests uh, for the country uh, and, and, and therefore uh, I want to um, make the legislative process uh, more sensible by being cooperative. And thirdly, um, I want to have good communication with the public. I want to make my intention known to the public. And, and, and listen to what they have to say about particular policies so that I will have a good support from the society in general. So when facing um, um, sort of the different opinions in the legislature, the, the social force uh, can get involved and try to balance uh, uh, the uh, different political forces in the legislature. So if I can ally myself myself with the, uh, the, the social forces, we can get um, 
the 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 greatest support uh, from Taiwan society for any particular agenda items. Great. This woman in front over here. Wait for the microphone, please. And thanks for your speech and your discussion. Jennifer Chen, reporter with Shenzhen Media Group China. You said you will maintain the status quo in the cross-street relationship. Does the status quo including admitting the 1992 consensus, like my Intel did, and Taiwan's current authority declares its support of one China principle? What's your position on that? Thank you so much. Thank you for that question. Um, I think my speech has uh, anticipated that question. So uh, I think I have answered all the questions in my speech. If you don't mind, you can go back and read that more carefully. OK. David Brown. Uh, David Brown from Johns Hopkins. Welcome. Thank you for your remarks. Yeah, in talking about cross-strait relations, you said uh, emphasize the importance of maintaining peaceful, stable relations, which, of course, is an American interest. Now, there's a great gap between your party's view of cross-strait relations and those of Beijing. And so many of us have been looking for the possibility of that gap being bridged in some fashion so that dialogue can continue. In your remarks about cross-strait relations, if I r recall them correctly, you said you want to maintain uh, stable cross-strait relations on the basis of the existing constitutional arrangement. Now, you're an, uh, a lawyer, and I'm sure you use those words carefully. What did you mean by them? <laughs> oh, uh, the term I use is existing constitutional order. Um, I uh, have to, uh, okay, I'll give you a um, professor's answer to the definition of that term, constitutional order, which covers uh, the provision of the Constitution itself, subsequent amendments, interpretations, court decisions uh, based on these uh, provisions, and practices uh, by uh, different divisions of the government and, and different sectors of the population here. So uh, anything that is related to the constitution and the interpretation and practice of it are, is part of that constitutional order. Okay, woman in the back with the pink jacket. Thank you, Chairwoman Tsai. I'm Rita Chen from Central News Agency. Uh, sorry about that. I need to ask her regarding the 1992 consensus again, because I don't hear that you mentioned about the 1992 consensus during your speech. I just wonder, how will you maintain the status quo? And th does DPP accept the 1992 consensus? If you, uh, DPP do doesn't accept the 1992 consensus, what is your plan A or plan B to replace it? Yeah, thank you. Well. Again, uh, let me suggest you to go back and read my speech uh, very carefully. It was the points I was trying to make in my speech. So please. Okay, over here. Please wait for the microphone. Uh, nice to see you, Dr. Tsai. I'm Zhong Ho Tao, a visiting fellow in uh, says John Hopkins University. And my question is, uh, what's the relationship between your statement of maintaining the uh, cross strait status quo and DPP's uh, Taiwan Independence Clause? Okay, in Chinese, 就是您的維持現狀這種說法和民進黨的台獨黨綱之間究竟是什麼關係? Uh, 謝謝. Right. Uh, <laughs> believe or not, I have anticipated your question as well. Uh, the answer is all there. All right, we're going to take one last question. Uh, over here, woman in the gray. Wait for the microphone, please. Thank you. Thank you for your speech. Uh, I'm Zhao Yingfeng from War Journal. Um, you talk about building up Taiwan's military capability and achieving a peaceful cost regulations. I wonder, are they compatible? And how would you communicate with Beijing that you are committed to a peaceful relationship if you're building up the military capability? Also, last night, uh, the ambassador from China to the US, Ambassador Cui Tiankai, has made a comment uh, on your visit. 
he said, uh, instead of talking to the Americans, why don't you pass the test of the 1.3 billion people in mainland China first? What would you uh, reply to that? Thank you. Oh, this is a press question. Uh, I think the ambassador has said uh, things that uh, he uh, needs to say in his position. So I have no further comment on that. Uh, on um, what is your first issue? Oh, uh, the military capability we're trying to build is def defense in nature, which uh, not we don't intend to build a, a military capability of def offensive nature. So um, that is pretty consistent with our goal to establish a stable and peaceful relationship with China. Well, if there's a world, there's a way. I mean, um, I'm sure China feel uh, there's a need to talk to us. Uh, uh, the same applies to us. We, need, we feel that there's a need to talk to them. So if, again, if there's a world, there's a way. Well, I think we've just about run out of time. We will be posting uh, Dr. Tsai's speech on our website, so you can go back and study it carefully. <laughs> I want to thank you all for coming. Please join me in thanking Dr. Tsai.